Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are. We're glad to have you joining us. And while you join, we've got a tradition of just kind of finding out what the distribution of everybody is. Where are you today? Uh, kind of fun to see how far away people are from joining us. We've got Jerry Dallas. David, there we are. Okay, I know it's a good session when David Dave Coke joins from Philadelphia. Sarah, Colorado Springs. Timothy, Pennsylvania. We're getting some Pennsylvania people. Dan from Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, look at everybody. I can't even keep up with this. Dominican Republic. Midland, Texas, Cleveland, Dominican Republic. Oh, that's some nice weather, I'm sure. Cleveland, Ohio. Welcome, everybody. We'll give it another minute or two. Quad Cities, Iowa. John from Farmingdale. Quad Cities. I mean, is that just you have four cities and you didn't want to just name them? I don't know. William from Rockford, Ohio. Ah, Sophie from Montreal. Tony Brentwood, the Tennessee. Look at Ganya. Mm -hmm. From your neck of the woods. Yep. That's not near Nashville. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, exactly. So I, I guessed it on the naming <laughs> of that city. It's kind of like the people that name the road Seven Mile Road. And you're like, all right, run out of names. <laughs> all right. Let's... Uh, Let's get it rolling, I think. I think there's enough people here. Um, welcome, everybody. This is uh, today's Autodesk Community Conversation. My name is Sean Hurley. I'll be your host today. We're joined by Danya Tabor Hansen. And this is Revit Henson Hacks. All right. Community conversations are virtual meetups featuring expert speakers from across the community. Ses sessions range from deep dives, tips and tricks, and live demonstrations on products such as AutoCAD, Revit, Dynamo, Fusion 360, industry roundtables, emerging trends, career stories, all sorts of things, um, all experience levels from beginners to experts. And you can actually lead yours as well. Um, let's go to that next slide, Ganya, the fun one from the lawyers. <coughs> this is just a quick statement stating that uh, um, Anything that we say that is forward-looking, future things, um, don't make any purchasing decisions based on those. Make them based on the purchase of product as it is right now. So if, if Danya says Revit's gonna have a unicorn horn on the front of the screen someday, well, it might, but you can't make a purchasing decision based on that. So next. Uh, this is kind of our, our little guidance on this. Um, we mute the lines so that we don't have a whole bunch of things. I'm, unfortunately, I have a squeaky chair today, but you're going to hear that until I go on mute. We ask you to turn on your camera if you, if you feel comfortable with that. It kind of gives us a, a virtual, like we're here in the room together, um, kind of place a name to a face, um, and hopefully you'll join us in AU. We'll get to do it real in, in real life, which would be fun. We're hoping to do a community conversation and some stuff there. If you have a question, because this is a conversation, if you have a question, please raise your hand. There's a little uh, in the bottom right of Zoom, you can just use a little hand function and we'll call on you and unmute you. Or you can ask in the chat and um, as time permits, um, we'll uh, bring those up with Danya. And this is, a, this is a conversation. These sessions are recorded and the, uh, the link to the recording will be on the event page. And I will paste that into the chat here in just a second. Um, that's where I'll post all the links as well on the event page. So just where you signed up and registered, that's where you'll see the video in case you miss a part of it or you want to share it with somebody or any of the links that Donya may talk about. So, all right. And I'm Sean Hurley, Autodesk Community Engagement Manager. I'm a geeky technologist located in sunny Bend, Oregon. Take it away, Danya. 
Okay, hi. My name is Donnie Tabor Hansen. I am in Knoxville, Tennessee, God's country, as I like to say. Um, and I've been doing Revit for a long time, and my favorite thing is just sharing things. So let's just let's just dive right in to today's session. All right. Today we're going to be talking about a chain. What is a chain? How to create a chain template, the schedules, the families, the tags, the reverse of it. And I'm also going to share a dynamo on finding mirrored items, which I will share with you guys uh, later. You can download from the, the question sections uh, on the website. So let's start off with what is a chain? Well, um, a chain has, they usually have several locations in the same name. Uh, the buildings look similar. Uh, brand recognition is, their, is in their style. So like, who knows the piece of joint with a red roof? You know, so you can see how that can take place. Um, Generally, they are franchised so that there is a central management group that governs their designs. Uh, they may work with more than one architect or engineering firm or even one consulting group. We are, I'm in with the food service industry as consultants. So we do a lot of restaurants. Um, so maybe you're also on the internal team of a chain restaurant. That's maybe why you're interested in hearing this today. Um, they have a standardized business practice in the way that they uh, the way that they look, the things that they offer, um, their decor, their menus, their internal brands, etc. Uh, you can tell that it's theirs. Um, and some of them, uh, examples of them, retail, pharmacies, groceries, restaurants, car care, clinics. So although when we talk about chains in my world, it's always the chain. We've got a chain team and when they got the everything else team meaning the restaurants, but you can see there's a lot of different chains uh, around. So we're gonna talk about creating your chain template. Um, the first thing you gotta do, and you gotta find a good version of, for the chain. And, and I mean a good template, we're gonna, a project that has been checked and rechecked and checked again and cleaned out of anything that's not used unless it has types that you may use later. You don't wanna just purge everything because you may have a catalog of shelving in there that you may want to use varieties of them later. But yeah, it, as this chain progresses, sometimes there's things get moved around stuff. So you, you may not wanna purge everything out of some families, but you do wanna clean things up. Um, for example, display cases, um, Maybe this one doesn't use the 66 inch version and you might wanna use it later. So, so just leave that in there. And then you wanna save it out as a detached project if you're using collaboration. Uh, to be a true template, it can't have work sets in it. So this is a crossroads where you must choose if work sets are necessary. Um, then you will be able to you know, open the project and save a detached version to start a new template. Um, if you have to remain with the work sets, that's the only way to do it. Uh, you can copy the file over. I always recommend just uh, going in, saving a detached version. But before you do that, make sure you got a copy somewhere because somebody will go ahead and start working in one that is still close to that central file. But if you don't have to have um, the work sets, of course you can save it out as a project, as a template project. Um, yeah, so you are gonna want to review it. And I mean, review it and check your projects, check your sheets, check your views, check your schedules. And then the next thing you wanna do is review it again. Um, check the annotation styles for any extras that you might have uh, left behind. Say if you've got a custom tag for this project, then go in and take out your company's other tag. You wanna make sure that they can't accidentally go back and get the wrong thing. Um, check it for text, dimension styles. Uh, make sure they're set to the, uh, the most used one as your default. Um, then we're going to review it from the back to the front. Have you ever done that with a project? Start at the back of the project and go, this view is here because does it, is it still valid in this project? And just review everything from your details. Uh, check your elevations, make sure everything is still cleaned up in there. Um, and it takes another perspective to review it from the, the back. Um, when you're looking at the sheets, especially. Uh, I know when I used to copy list routines, I'd always check them from the back. It makes a different perspective doing that way. Um, 
And in this way, you can also track everything that's connected correctly with uh, view markers, view names, um, anything that you have that you want to check on that. Um, check the link files to see if you're going to be if they're going to be need to be pulled and reviewed in the same manner as your project file. Um, so that you can get a chance of reviewing everything. And if that is going to be left in there, um, then maybe we you want to make sure that it goes with you if you're going to be having a file that's going to be connected with it. And we're going to continue on with this part about creating a chain in a little bit. For now, we're going to talk about some things we do inside of getting a chain ready. Families, y'all know this is one of my favorite topics in Revit. If you've been hanging with me for a while, I love my families. Um, when you're working on a chain restaurant and, and you have all these components that schedule, we found that it went from an instance to a type for tagging when we went to a chain. Um, that family may have been used in various places. It may be in your library, you use it in other uh, projects. But when it comes to a chain, generally that component or that wall type or that door type, you're gonna keep the same numbers and stuff tagging it all the time. So you go from an instance to a type with that. Uh, now, if, you know, this may be creating different tags to point to different named uh, identity factors, of, identity factor parameters, such as if, it's, if you use an item number, can you, is there a type number that you can use? I know in doors, there's, there's an item, there's a, a mark and then a type mark and stuff. So you, you may want to start looking at that and seeing about bringing them in separately. Check your tag and make sure you have to go into the correct place. Um, we have two built-in uh, tag uh, parameters that are loaded into every one of our component families. One is an instance and one is, is a type, but that's the way that we have just set ourselves up so that we can use it for either one. Um, don't forget your schedules may have to be edited. If you're gonna change, um, I'm not even tagging this through. <laughs> uh, you're gonna have to set up a chain library, but your schedules are also gonna have to be, I mean, up to your schedules are gonna be changed. Um, your schedule is going to have to be changed because they're going to have to reflect the new uh, parameter that you're going to for the type. Um, and in, instead of using the uh, other parameters, so you may have to do this. Don't forget to change the sorting or filters that you may need coming up. And then you may want to start, I'm going to go ahead and read this, <laughs> rename the families to reflect the chain. Um, when they become a type and they're not used only for that chain, I'm probably going to set them aside in a separate library. So you're going to set your chain library. And what we do with our family so that it reflect that it's used for a chain is we'll put the initials on the chain at the end of the family name, like an underscore. If it was Autodesk, I would probably be the underscore capital A, capital D. And that would be my Autodesk families. And then I would put them in a separate part of the library. So all of my, all of my families for that chain are in one location. So they can be pulled as they need to be. You can go ahead and just leave them in your template if you if you have that many but so I've got some that are in there sometimes in there another time but so uh, when you rename those you may want to go through and look at some of those and like so we do it with an underscore and the capital letters at the end you can put it at the beginning if you want I don't like it at the beginning because I like to go through and see what my family names are if I'm looking for a char broiler I don't want to look down and have to go through something to get to where it says char broiler um, and set the library up from the location that, that Everybody that is going to be working on a chain is going to have access to it. And maybe you have different areas in that location. Maybe you get some for annotation, uh, subdirectories for loadable categories. Um, and take the project that's been harvested from and make a copy of that for transferring standards. And you can take it and that that's one, if you're using cloud-based uh, cloud models, and you're trying to set up one that's going to remain with work, work sets, you can use one that is detached and has no work sets and set it aside that has, once you get your template set up, you're going to have your schedules in it, you're going to have your tags in it, you're going to have your views, your view templates, uh, filters. Um, and you, know, you can have this one set up where you can delete everything in there, uh, plans and everything like that, but you want to keep your schedules, you want to keep your drafting views, and stuff, and this is just going to be your thing, something that you harvest from. I call mine. This is to steal from. 
um, I do this when I set up a, a my own templates for each version. I'll set I'll save me up a project that says to still from 2020. It's my 2020 to still from. And if somebody goes and messes something up, and I don't know what I did to that. Well, I can always go and transfer project standards from that. So set yourself up with one of these from your chain also, because you're going to have more custom stuff in a chain than you will in your typical daily template that you use. Um, and yeah, you want to be able to transfer, you can transfer your annotation styles, filters. Uh, some of the most common things that we use, we can transfer over. Um, next, it's time to export and clean up the library. You can export all of your families. That's fine. Let's go dig through all of them. Generally, I just want to export some. Um, I want to export my annotation. I want to export my, um, my loadable families from whichever category they're in. Um, and remember when you export out a family, out of a project, there's some Klingon stuff that comes with it. It will bring all the, the special materials out of the uh, project and that's not necessary. Uh, so you may wanna have to clean those up um, unless you like analytical materials in your uh, sink that you've made or something. Uh, look for analytical, default, uh, earth. Uh, there's assistance family and poche. Those are the ones I go after most of the time that I, I clean out of all my families when I've, I go. So you go in and purge them out, but purging doesn't get some of those materials. So you'll have to open up materials and actually just extract those. I really don't like those. Um, and don't forget your chain uh, or your chain um, cut your, I'll get the word here in a second catalogs. Don't forget your catalogs that you have uh, created. If you've had the catalog exterior, external uh, files that you need, the TXT file, and I always keep an Excel file to match it. If you've got those somewhere else, you will want to make sure that it matches up with the things that you have inside your projects. So you may have to make a, may have to edit it, make a new um, Excel file to go to a text file. I go in and, and if it's gonna have a special um, type number, I'll go in and, and if I can put that in the in the catalog, then I'll put that in the catalog for it and save the catalog out with that. I'm always reviewing these with the, the designer that's in charge of the project to make sure that I've got the correct uh, item numbers that they are using because I'm not the one that assigns that they are. So I have to make sure I review those with that. But yeah, make sure you pull out and get your catalogs. If you have to go fetch your TXT file, and, and if you're keeping the Excel file, go get that, bring it over when you bring over to your chain library, make sure the names and stuff are, are matching up and then do any editing inside of there that you may need. Yeah, don't forget your catalogs. Um, and don't forget to check for any custom annotation tags. If you have customized an annotation tag because that customer says, I've got to have a tag that looks like a pill as opposed to an octagon or a square. Uh, make sure you pull those out and then make sure you remove your others from in there. Um, and also remove the materials from those. Uh, I haven't seen a tag yet that needs any materials. I can just delete all of them out, but they will, when you take them out of a the project, they will go get them and look, hey, come on with me. Extra luggage is always fun. Um, now, Let's talk about the families one more thing here. You can rename the families inside the project before you bring them out. Or if you bring them out and rename them, then we'll put them back in. You can't just go in and swap them out so easy sometimes. But if you, actually swapping is the easiest thing to do, but you've got to make sure that you swap it so that it's tagged and stuff. So you want to just, you don't want to just delete the one and put it back in because there may be tags and stuff going with it. You don't want to, you want to put it, you want to bring it in and then go pick on it and go through the type indicator and swap it out that way. That way the tags and everything will remain with it. So be careful when you are changing things out. If you didn't rename them in the family or in the project, you could also, if you've renamed them, if you go and rename them, you can batch rename them with some dynamos and stuff. If they're in a directory, you can add a, a prefix or a suffix to them. And now you could go in and you can actually run a dynamo and do the same thing in the other end 
if you're very careful. I've seen it happen. Um, but you can go in and if you've named it in your directory and you, you can go in and just rename it the same thing in your project and then you can just load it on top. So there's a couple of things you can do there. You can rename it before you bring it out or if you bring it out, you can rename it here and then bring it in and swap it or you can bring it out, rename it, rename it here and then load it back in on top of it, replace it. So just be aware that this is the type of thing you got to concentrate on when you are redoing these families. You want them to be consistent in your project. You don't want to have the other ones in there. If you've renamed them and loaded some in, you want to take those out. You want to clean it up with the things that are specifically for chains. Yes. So yeah, I've done this a lot. This is why I'm so, I can give you all the little gitches that, you know, things that have got me in the past. And that's one of them is, is when you're transferring those families back and forth. Okay, so when it comes to schedules, um, you want to make sure you change any schedules that, uh, if they've been using instant parameters, you want to change them to the tagging number. They will need to be updated. Uh, if the same parameters being used, uh, it's capable of being swapped from an instant parameter to a type parameter. That's the best. Um, if the family is being renamed and changed outside of the family, they will have to be uh, reloaded and checks done. So you want to make sure that you check once you load it back in, check your schedule, make sure everything is showing up properly there also. Um, and the fastest way to do checks would be to have a schedule that would show both the instant number and the type number if you've been using instant previously. So that you can uh, compare those, um, look at them side by side in, the, in a working schedule, and then you can change your print schedule to have just the type now. And then once you, yeah, once you get it set, then you can just remove the instant one up there. Um, do not remove the schedules from that standard file, the standard file where you save it out and it's gonna be the one you steal things from. Um, make sure you leave it in there. And also your drafting views, make sure you leave them in there. I think I mentioned that before, but yeah. When you are looking at um, the schedules, keep them in your standards, the steal from file that you have. Okay, schedules, tags. Mm -hmm. Make sure you check all the tags by editing them and making sure they're going to the correct parameter. If the item number has changed to mark, if it's gone from mark to type mark, make sure you're getting the correct parameter in there. Um, again, if it's the same parameter, it's, it's just that much easier. So you don't have to worry about that. Determine if there's any custom tags per chain. Um, Anything that they're going to have to have, like I said, they may want a different style. I've, I've had them change that on us in the past. We try to use our standards, but sometimes they'll push back and uh, it's like, well, this is the way our product product looks, right? Well, this is the way we want your product to look for us because they're they're used to having their way. They've got their own branding. Um, maybe they require things tagged differently in different views. For example, we have a chain that wants the components to be tagged in the overall plan with just the number. But then when it comes to the electrical sheet, they want it tagged with an E in front of it. Um, and then they want a P in front of it and others. So I've created a tag that I can go in and put a prefix in front of the number. And I created four types. It's electrical, it's plumbing, mechanical, gas. And all they got to do if they're tagging, they just have to go get that, that tag, the MEP tag, and then pick which type that they're tagging with. And that automatically puts the, the letter in front of it. And that has helped out a lot to be able to have those custom tags just because this one wanted it. I didn't want to have to create different parameters so I could have, okay, you're tagging this electrical tag is tagging, or the main tag is tagging the item number. Well, I got to duplicate the item number to get an electrical number, duplicate it for the plumbing number. No, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to slide that tag in there, that, that number in there that they had to see. Uh, and I can show you, um, yeah, I think I got on this one. You can also go into your schedules and set up a text parameter in front, uh, I put it in front of the number and I fill that text parameter and then combine the two parameters for a column that has the E or the P or whatever in front of the number two. So it's 
it's an easy way to fix some of that stuff without having to add extra parameters. I fix it in the schedule, I fix it in the tag, I don't fix it in the item. That way I don't have to add, remember, add all these parameters, these different ones. Um, don't forget also to rename the tag. You know, if you have if you have to do this, something like that, if you've got custom tags, make sure you've got a different name on it with the chain name on it. Okay. Um, Sophie made a comment, Danya. We have the same the, thing with colored tag. We have like five types. Five types, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's easy to have those tags that just have a type in it. And then you, you put the text in and you move it up a half an inch. You put the text in, move it up an inch. You get all the text right and then you make sure they're set for their visibility. And then you put them all back together and send it on its way, test it. Maybe that's gonna be a blog post for me is that how to do tags, yes. There's an idea. Um, all right, so now we're gonna go back to that idea of creating a chain template. Um, you're gonna reload any families that are needed, uh, if that, that have been changed. If the families were renamed prior, pulled out, uh, pulled out before editing, it's just a reload. Again, if they're renamed, and we've talked about the renaming. Um, uh, swap out tags to the ones with the type value instead of instance, if any tags have been in there. Um, and they can be swapped out fairly easily using the right click, select all in view or select all in project, depending on how brave you really are. Um, and that way you can just swap those out. Um, one of the more important things uh, we did is put the notes, we put notes on our landing page uh, so that others in the project can follow along. And these notes will be pertaining to anything that's custom to the chain that has been done. Any of our custom parameters that we have hijacked to assist in things like this, um, they're used uh, a lot in some of these. So um, yeah, and then after you do all that, you gotta purge three times. I'm gonna pop over and show you, um, for some reason I've got everybody sitting down here on the bottom. I can't get to my rabbit there, aha. I want to show you our notes. This is, I've, okay, I've taken a chain restaurant. We're going to look into this a little bit more. This is, okay, I'm tired of talking. This is, going to be, um, these are our project notes. And as I've taught in the past, and for those that may have missed it, I'm going to go over briefly. The, when I manage my uh, shared parameters, our shared parameters have the XYZ parameters. I named them XYZ, they're at the bottom. And I've got 10 area integer, length, number, text, volume, yes, no's. And that, those are parameters that can be used without having to edit parameters in our um, shared parameter file. And they're used for any, anything and everything. I use text one is used for comments form, where comments was formerly used because comments in a schedule is an instant parameter at all times. You can't add it to your, to your family, it's just there. When you put, when you load it in, but I added text one so that I could hit type comments, and so type that's why we use text one. This uses type comment where comments is an instant parameter. In the plumbing remarks for we use plumbing remarks for the above slab um, schedule, but we use text two for the in slab schedule for their plumbing comments. We have a TM utilities. Uh, TM utilities is one that. That's my workhorse parameter. Uh, I talked about in the community conversation on parameters and it's my workhorse. It's one that turns things different colors in different views. It, it puts them in different schedules. We use it a lot for, uh, especially for filtering in and out of schedules. So in TM utilities is set, if it contains four, it goes into the in slab schedule. And if it contains seven, it keeps it out of the above slab. Because if you do a plumbing schedule, you want everything in it. If we want above slab, we just want the things above slab. For in slab, we just want the things that are in slab, but they make, there's some crossover. So if it contains four, it goes in here. But if it contains seven, it doesn't go in here. So this one could contain four. But this one absolutely has to contain four. But it can't contain seven. Yeah, it takes, it takes almost a, a, a chart to fill this one out. Um, again, TM Utilities comes up again. Five puts it in the bare schedule. 
soda and beer schedule. Uh, text three is used for their remarks. Text four is for wall blocking tagging. TM utilities set to six goes in. See, that's my, that's my workforce now. And that puts it in the chef's table for the chef's table load schedule. So get yourself some notes like this. Put it on your landing page so that when someone comes in, a new employee comes in and we get this team member, you're going to work on this chain restaurant. Here's some of the things you need to know that's going to be custom only to this project, this type of project. Let me find my schedules. And when I go to a, you get my working equipment and utility schedule. This will show my TM utilities. And you can see I've got zero, one, four, seven, uh, two, two is electrical, one is plumbing. Um, if it's just a one, that means it's going to be in the above slab. Uh, one could be in the other one, but uh, you can see I've got, here's a one, two, and a four. This guy's busy. It's a two compartment sink, but he's got electrical. There's an outlet that's attached to this one. Um, so yeah, you can see I use that TM utilities for going in there. Here's my plumbing. Plumbing, it has either a P or a G. And the parameter I used for that was text six. Text six tells it whether it's going to be plumbing or gas. That goes into the tag. And then on the plumbing schedule, we have an above slab plumbing schedule. Their numbers have either P or G or PG. It has both. This one has both. So we set those up and like, oh, here, this little guy missed it. So we can go over to the working schedule and look for 234. Now go down here to 234, way down here to 234. So see, this is a checks place where I'm having this working schedule. And also we go in here, this is a remote compressor, it doesn't have gas. So it just needs capital P put in here. And then of course that reflects over in the working schedule, come on. Seriously, did I get the wrong one? Did I hit, tw I hit 23, not 20. Yeah. Yeah, I hit the wrong one. Where, oh, I'm looking over here. Dad, burn, two, 34. Dyslexic in me likes to put things in various places. Now, yeah, it works. So you can reflect in there because I've got the same parameter in here. The text six parameters here, but it's one of the ones that's turned off. So I can utilize some of these things and check on it here and make sure that everything is working the way it's supposed to. Do I have text six in here? Oh, I got to edit my remarks. You think I may have left this stuff so I can show you how to do this? So all I got to do is just come in here and say text six is for P or G for plumbing schedules, period. Consistency, I want to make sure that I highlight this and go bold and underline. So yes, make sure you document it. Take your time when you're doing this. When you change something, immediately go here to your notes and immediately put it in there so that you can keep up with what's going on. And this is where you and your teammates collaborate with each other. So then, yeah, check for excessive materials, object styles, purge three times on anything that you're putting back into the family um, and reload the family and purge. And then you can purge types if you want to once they're reloaded back in, keeping your family uh, with all its types in your library. So then I think at that point, you're ready to save it as a template file. And you could do a save as and, and drop down to template and template will let you do it. So let's just pop over there. And if I go file, save as, I can drop into a template and you'll see it would come up and give me an RTE extension on there. So that gives you what you need for setting up a template. But again, if you have work sets in the project, save it as a project, save it as a detached project somewhere else, make it a central file, and then make you a copy of it somewhere else because somebody will accidentally go in there and use it incorrectly. Um, and make this copy before anyone else gets a chance to get to it, before you say, oh, we've got a template. Yeah, make a copy over there. All right, 
Now, the next thing is something you got to think about if you're doing chains, and that is you got to reverse them. So now we got to flip it. And you know you have to have a right and a left version of the project. It, 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 you have to have the two to help give the option based on location where the, the road entrance lead of the property and stuff. It's so your right hand, left hand version. Um, so you do want to have be able to set up the reverse on it. You got to be careful. There are some things that you cannot really mirror in a project. Um, I mean, you can mirror them, but you shouldn't. Uh, most of your architectural system families are going to work just fine. Walls, floors, ceilings, roofs, stairs, ramps, rails, etc. All of your system families are going to work probably just fine. The ones you got to be careful about are the ones that are loadable components that could have some problems. Um, for example, plumbing equipment. You want to flip your hot and cold water? <sighs> Not if you're working with a good MEP group. Um, so, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, if some of these components that can't be flipped is your faucets. You can flip your sink unless your faucet's attached to it. Um, what about equipment with controls on them? Uh, a control panel or a door swing? What if it has a door swing? And if you flip it, you know, you can flip it. Does that component change model numbers because you flipped it? Does the right hand have a different model number than the left hand version? So you have to be very careful about these things. Um, and components that are not symmetrical uh, with controls on one side or the other, those are the ones you've got to watch out for. And um, then door swings, are, they, are the components called out because of the door swings? We have some that are called out because of whether it's a left hand or right hand swing. Um, and then let's, let's really think about hard stuff here. What about your column grids, column numberings? Do you really want to reverse these? Um, you know, do you have, um, is that, I mean, is that okay with you? Do you have no notes referring to column lines like this piece of equipment near this column line? Are you referring to these column numbers in any way? And you can't, you don't want to delete them and start over. You really want, might want to renumber them because you want to make sure, do you have any dimensions that go to them? <laughs> don't delete them rascals. You gotta have to keep them where they are. Uh, you gotta watch out for things like that um, when you're doing things that are reversed. So, and in the kitchen, the only thing you can re you can reverse is uh, shelving, uh, tables, uh, sinks, unless the faucet's in with them. I do set up some families so that I can say uh, is flipped, and is flipped means that you mirrored it. And then I've got a second version of the faucet that is mirrored inside of there, so you can flip it back around. You'll turn the original off and the other one on. So that. That's one way you can get around some of those things. I do that with chains more than I will anything else. I don't normally add faucets to sinks unless the chain has recommended it, but on everything else, they put a sink in, they put a faucet in separately. So it's only in chains that I would do something like that. Um, but you gotta be careful of your mechanical equipment. Does it have controls on one side or the other? Does it come where it makes the others? Because the first time I got my rear end sheet at this, at this company from a boss was like, why did you do that oven like that? Well, the designer brought it to me. It says, I need this Lang oven to be reversed because we we're doing the, the left-hand side of this project. And I'm, like, and I'm like, okay, fine, I can do that. And here you go. That was the day that I learned, did they come and ask me something? The first thing I asked them is, can I see a spec sheet? I want to make sure it has that opportunity to be reversed. And it also gives you a chance to check on the model numbers and stuff. So yeah, that's a problem. So how do you find the mirrored items? I have a dynamo and I know you guys love to have dynamos. I'm gonna give this to you guys later. So I've got a dynamo and I'm gonna go back into my project. And this one's not too bad. I've seen some of them where I can light this thing up like a Christmas tree, but this one, um, this is a pretty clean project. I, here you see my scope boxes and I don't have the architectural in this file because um, this is one I'm looking at starting as a template. So I'm cleaning it up. Well, this is the copy of it because I'm playing around with it here. So this one has, um, doesn't have the architectural file in here. It just has our components and stuff in here. So I've got a dynamo and I go to the manage tab, get my dynamo and I'm gonna share this one with you. 
It's called TM uh, Fine uh, TM Mer Fine Merit. I'll see what the title is in a minute. TM has stuff more than uh, oh, it's a uh, Trimark. And let's bring this up. Yeah, I've been using. It. I've been playing with it here. Saul, here is and Jacob the, are going to be so it, proud of you, Danya. Do what? I said Saul and Jacob are going to be so <laughs> proud of you. Uh, yeah, this one I'm just like, yeah, look at this. Oh, here's a, a Dynamo um, download that you need is Data Shapes because it will create a package info stamp. And I want to show you this. Like, um, and it let me put something here. And this tells me any packages that I have in this. Look, there's no extra packages in this script, so I can give it to you. You don't have to worry about downloading anything else. You can run this straight with Dynamo, okay? That's very important to me when I hand out Dynamo stuff, is making sure that I either tell you what scripts you've got or else you need to be able to, I don't want that in there. I want that in there. Uh, you need to be able to know which Dynamo packages to run, so, or to go download. So now all this is doing is going to get in family instances, um, feeding it into the, Boolean mask here, and it's going to change its color. Element override color in view. So it's only going to do it in this one view. So I'm going to go to a 3D view because I'm going to see everything. So with this, I'm going to hit run and run started, run completed. And let me close this down here. Oh, yeah, I got a few things that are colored. Okay, other things that can be mirrored my wall backing. It's wall backing. Uh, what are you? Look here. This is a um, end cap wall end cap. Go around the kitchen, I'll be hit with things and stuff. So they got an end cap in here. I don't know why it's coming up through this drip tray. We'll let, check that out later. Yeah, you know, who cares if that one's flipped? It's not got a left or right hand thing on it. Um, something's showing up here. That is the dishwasher. And it looks like it's got some nested item. I don't care about it. It's, it's symmetrical in there. And I want to flip my view around some because I want to see if there's anything. Else. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a big one there. I don't see anything else. But here, here's a big one. This is a sink. And this sink has got a faucet in it. No, this is one of mine that says it's flipped. So is it flipped? Yes. That I know puts my hot. You're not going to see any changes. But all it did was swap the faucet out for the other one that's nested in there that has the hot cold water on the other side. So with this, I've got this, and then I can know whether I want to go in here and mirror them back around on themselves, which of course won't work for the sink because it's not a symmetrical sink. It's a, it's a U-shaped sink, so flipping it's not gonna help. So therefore I have to have the thing that will flip the faucet. But if it's you know shelving, I don't care. If it's tables that have nothing on, I don't care. If it's gonna be one of you know this type of thing, well, he's symmetrical anyway. This little guy, yeah, I care because that coffee maker, you know, he, he comes in one way, the, the controls are one way. You know, you can look at things and say, well, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. This one, yeah, I would. So it depends on what the thing is as to whether or not you're gonna go flip it again. So that's up to you. So now how do you get it back? Cause we got these things flipped and you can do this in any view. It's, if you're gonna be wanting to flip things back you may wanna go into a plan view so that you can go right there and just flip them around the center of themselves. Um, just do a mirror, don't copy, you know, but to, to get it back, it's another dynamo. And I'm going to give you that one also. So I'm just going to close this down and go, no, I don't want to save anything. We're fine. And now I want to remove the override colors in the view. Now I've gone in and set up a code block that has the type of equipment that we would have. Uh, I've got furniture, mechanical equipment, plumbing fixtures, lighting fixtures, generic model, special equipment. I'm just feeding my categories in there. And all this is going to do is going to, um, let's see, Springstock Active View. Let's make sure we've got not, not got anything else in here. Let's go to that package stamp. When you get a moment, Donya, we have a question for you. Okay, I'm just about finished with this. So yeah, package stamp. And this one says, nope, no extra ones in here. So I'm just going to go ahead and run it. And then when I close, I'm not saving any changes. I flip myself out of Revit. <laughs> Somehow, all the colors are gone. Everything's back to normal. So even my sink over here is back to normal. So um, 
that will let you remove any color overrides that you have. And I am going to share these in the chat after the webinar is over. And the next slide is, yes, what did you have? <laughs> uh, we had, so in your family, this is from Sophie, mm -hmm. you have two faucets, one that is regular and one that is flipped? Yes. All right, that answers that. And then Dan gave a, a warning, be cautious mirroring grouped elements. Oh, you're grouping things? Be cautious grouping things. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let's, let's just preface that one. That's a um, meta thing. That's an in, internal loop there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Groups are not always the easiest things to work with. Um, I use cautious at all times. Of it. I made groups for one of my chains because I wanted the designer, I wanted them to be able to take, and these things are always in this order, but the building may change. So I always want to be able to drop these things in. And I make groups out of them with their tags in the um, coordination plan, which is the main overall plan. And then I went into the plumbing views and I did another group of the plumbing fixtures and the tags that were in there and the electrical. So they had several groups, making sure that all of the groups had the same insertion point. You can move your insertion point. I always pick the lower corner of a wall nearby and they could go then and, and put these things in as long as they put them on top of it. Then they can show and group them. That's the caveat. They should always ungroup them, I think, when they do that. So groups are, so yeah, I've done groups for chains um, and they're saved out and saved into our library and they can use them, but it is in the documentation that we have for them how to use them. And the, when you put them in, the first thing they do is ungroup them. So I have different feelings about groups, but yeah, if you're, if you're mirroring things, yeah, be careful. Are there any other questions? Dance. Dan further qualified, not me, but someone might. And then, <laughs> and then Sophie said, and also model in place. Oh yeah, model in place items. Uh, they are real funny if you try to mirror those two. They may not, they may throw up on things. Yeah. Uh, and it may depend on what they tried to attach to or whether they were attached to anything. But yeah, I've had trouble with model in place. We do model in place some of our like countertops for the bar area, things like that. But so yeah, we play around in that realm a little bit too. And Any other questions? Michael uh, said, if a group has a bad practice in it, or me mirroring can make that much worse. If your groups are, are simple and perfect, it should be okay, but that's a risky proposition. Yeah, I don't want to go down the group path. <laughs> not a groupie? I'm, a, I'm not a groupie, no. <laughs> I mean, she asked me to do groups. We had a long discussion about it. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. But... I did a lot of documentation on the use of it and how to, to actually work with them. But yeah, mirroring is not something in the I would rather ungroup it than mirror it. And I'm going to have to mirror it. Yeah, that, when we yeah when we do that, the reverse, we do mirror. There's a blog post right there. I'd rather ungroup it than mirror it. Yeah. Is, isn't that what you just said? Did no, I, I would rather ungroup before I mirror it. Oh, okay. If, if you're going to have to mirror a grouped things, I would rather ungroup them and then mirror them, then you can group them back. But yeah. Seems like something you should know. Yeah. I've got a blog post coming up. Um, I am on the Community Voices blog post. So you can find me there. Everything's being prefaced with branding. I have done my hints and hacks on everything now. So I'm just, we've decided we brand, I branded myself. Um, and I'm doing, I want to do hints and hacks on a perfect example of when to do a group. And I'll just leave that as a teaser out there to get you guys to go to the blog post later. Um, when the blog post comes out, I'll probably put it in the chat from this uh, community uh, conversation here. But uh, yeah, do uh, look for others uh, in the community conversations and do look for our community voices on our blogs because I'm hitting it heavy on both sides. You are, you are yeah. awesome. And I can't wait to see you at AU. Um, Sophie did have a, a follow-up. Said instead yes. of groups, what do you use for repeating items? Um, well, when you, um, okay. When you want to array things, I use a family. If you're um, if you're in a family, I use a nested family. <laughs> so I just I avoided even there. So um, if I were to array and group things, I would probably go back and then ungroup them afterwards. Okay. Um, but yeah, I have a tendency to do a lot of. Uh, if I have a group of things that have to be together, I'll make a family out of it. I've got a whole freaking chef's table with I don't know. Donya's all about making it. families. Yes. <laughs> yeah um 
Yeah, I, 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 I make a whole family with the nested items in there that can be swapped out and stuff if need be. And I mean, I've got, if you can, if you can imagine a chef's table with microwaves and, and anything and everything on it. We got it's a good, all with the prep. we got a good comment from Jerry. See, everybody held this until the end. They, they didn't <laughs> want to interrupt you. Um, first, I want to give Dan's comment. Great presentation. Lots of great topics to think about as always. Thank you for everything, Donya. Don't leave yet, anybody. Um, Jerry said, we do retail chains where the plans are different. So the interior yeah. elevations have to be done each time. Is there a way to make this quicker? Um, that's where we did the groups. We had the groups of things um, where we had all of this group of stuff stays together. Um, so I grouped like the cook line. This is the cook line here. When you talk about having to repeat things repeatedly, this is my chef's table. Wow. I mean, it's got prep stuff, prep tables in it. It's got warmers. It's got um, lots of shelves, things like that. It's going to take its own sweet time. But yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, it's not a group. It's family. <laughs> Uh, Sophie said, in multi-story, if the apartment separation walls are the same on 10 stories, I think that's a question. That is, okay, there you go. There's a great example for groups. If you're doing repeating architectural features and the interior walls are the same and the, the fixtures are all the same, yeah, that is an excellent idea for a group. That is when groups are, that's when they shine. Um, let's see, I've gotten out of architecture since I've gotten to this company. I don't do a lot of architecture anymore, but yeah, I did a dormitory and yeah, it was perfect thing for groups. Then when something changed, you change it once and they're all fixed. So that is your group. Yes. Thank you, Sophie. We got somebody who was curious about what you just showed there. Our Ashley Coco said, curious what bar and grill that example is. I cannot divulge my <laughs> customers. <laughs> That's uh yeah. That's, I, that would I be made a free sure commercial. I, I no, I made sure I removed all of their branding, all of their um all my custom uh, stuff in there that was for them. I just like, you know, let's just, yeah. Not gonna divulge that. Awesome. But yeah, that's- Anything that's, else? Last well, that, that's also a typical for some of the, uh, when I do a chef's table, that's the type of thing that's talking about with chef's tables. Awesome. All right, Donya. Thank you so much. That was, that was awesome. You yeah. covered a lot of territory as, yeah. as usual. Um, you know, people stay, stay tuned for future uh, Revit sessions with, with Danya, as well as on the Voices blog. Um, I posted a lot of the links here. The, um, you could also, if you want to be a community conversation speaker, I mean, David, you've been to almost every Dynamo and Revit session. You're, you're about ready to lead one of these, I, I swear. Um, but, uh, you know, you can email me. There's a, there's a, a form. I put it also in the uh, comments for this event section. So um, that that's also where the recording will be for anybody who missed anything. You'll get a survey at the end of the session. Please complete it. It will help us figure out what we do with community conversations, what, how we can make it better for you, um, all those good things. Um, and also it can give uh, ideas to, for Danya to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So there's many ways to connect, you know, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Facebook groups, voices, blog, community journal, holy cow. But check out all the community conversations. We're adding a bunch. And this month we actually added the AEC teams, uh, ask me anything, uh, YouTube events. So there was some this week on Dynamo. I think there is civil 3D and there's more Revit ones coming up and roadmap discussions. And if you wanna hear from the product team, the product managers, the ones that direct the product and listen to your feedback, they'll be taking your questions live on YouTube and that is on the Community Conversations uh, calendar. So we're just kind of putting those in there. Um, we are going to take a break in July. It's our annual summer break so that Danya can go and play and, and uh, do whatever she does. So anyway, thank you everybody for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing everybody again. And again, oh, AU, I can't wait. I'm excited. New Orleans, yes. if you have tips on New Orleans, email me. Yes. Yeah, yes. I'm looking for all kinds of uh, fun ones, you know, things that we can do as groups, you know? I'm looking to put together some informal groups just to go out and eat beignets. Although I did hear Cafe de Mont, 
uh, no longer does beignets to order. It's a window where they are cooked up ahead of time. So yeah. like the McDonald's of beignets. Yeah. So anyway, stay, stay connected to us. We appreciate you. Um, spread the word. Thanks Thank for coming. Cafe beignet. <laughs> I like that. Did you find the stop? <laughs>